So just like Devin's other project she was talking about, this is a three year study. Started as an undergrad and now I'm here in my final year of the project, which is exciting. Um, so we're actually, we're collaborating with three privately owned farms that are certified organic. Uh, there's two here in the Gallatin Valley. So we have uh, Strike Farms, which is right here in town. And then 13 Mile Lamb and Wool, which is out near Spring Hill, kind of Belgrade area. Um, then we have our big outlier. They're over in Boulder, Colorado, which is pretty cool. And that's Black Cat Farms. Um, so I thought first I'd just kind of talk about the operations and what they're like. So Strike Farms, um, they've been a big part of the Bozeman community for quite a couple of years. Uh, they grow a lot of different types of vegetables, a lot of leafy greens. Um, they have a CSA, uh, they do a lot of herbs, stuff like that. And for them, we are mainly um, going out and putting our own MSU sheep out onto these. Uh, just They ha started out with a six acre field the first year. They didn't get the plow on the ground in time. So uh, we just went out and grazed the alfalfa field because that's what we had. Uh, the next year, they ended up tilling everything up and most of the field ended up being vegetable crops. And then the last third was a cover crop. So we grazed that cover crop of pea and oat. Um, and then again, that's what we just finished like yesterday, I think. Yeah, yesterday is when I brought them off. So we took them off the field uh, yesterday. And then um, now we're gonna go back and do some soil sampling here in a little while. Um, and then we have 13 mile lamb and wool and they're a little bit smaller garden farming system. Uh, she has her own sheep, which makes my life really easy because I don't have to go out, put fence up, check the sheep every day. Um, and she grazes a squash crop residue. Um, the first year we did it at harvest, she had 18,000 pounds at harvest of squash, which is pretty cool. And then she just brought her sheep in there and we just let them graze. Um, and then at Black Cat, they're a really, I think, a very interesting system. Um, they have all sorts of different varieties of vegetables from eggplant to different types of peppers, uh, potatoes, tomatoes, like honestly anything you can imagine, they're probably growing it. Um, they're also raising sheep, geese, uh, hogs, and chickens. And all their livestock and produce end up going into their two restaurants that they own over in Boulder, Colorado, which is pretty neat. Um, the guy's, he's a restauranteur, he's a farmer, he's pretty much anything, so he's pretty busy. He's also the chef. He's also the <laughs> chef, yes. Yeah, so he does really everything. Kind of hard to get a hold of him sometimes, but... Um, so we have our three systems, and each year we kind of try to do the same thing as much as we can. We don't ask our farmers to change anything about what they're doing in their system. We let them do their thing, and we just go in and we put up six grazing exposures in our study area. Um, and they're about a meter squared, is that right? Yeah, so a meter squared, and they're literally just these hog panels that Devin worked really hard on cutting up for me. <laughs> and we take four T-posts and we pound them in the ground. Um, that just keeps the hog paneling from shifting around. And it's all hooked together with carabiners, so they're really easy to lift in and out of the field, which is nice for me. Um, so we have our six grazing exposures out there, and then we actually have a paired grazing plot and that's about, if you look on the front there, I actually have a diagram of the sampling areas. Um, so we have your our exposures and then we have a pear grazing plot 10 feet to the right and then 10 feet down. And that's just because our sheep really like to hang out in the shade by those exposures. Um, so to make it more representable to the entire field, we just measure away. And then we take soil samples within those grazing exposures and then in those sampling areas or the graze sampling area as well. Um, so we're doing just a general soil nutrient analysis. So we're digging down six inches with a soil probe. Um, and we put it down in the ground and we're compositing those. And then we're also doing bulk density, which is another type of measurement of compaction. Um, a little different than the pentrometer. So we're only going down about three inches and we'll pull up a sample and put them into these pre-measured uh, little tins. And then I'll take them and weigh that, or take them, weigh them, and then put them in a dryer for 24 hours and pull them out and weigh them again. Um, and then we have a measurement of the actual probe, what the area of the probe is on the inside. And we use that to calculate the bulk density of the soil. Um, and then we are also taking biomass samples and doing just a general nutrient analysis of what's out there to just kind of get an idea what our, what our livestock are eating. Um, and then those, general soil samples we're taking. We're also 
have sent off to a lab um, and they're doing a DNA microbial analysis. So pretty similar to people out on fields. Um, hopefully we're gonna get that data back this week and I'm pretty excited about it. So um, pretty so no really results microbial wise, but um, looking at soil nutrients, we're not really seeing much of a difference in grazed versus ungrazed. You can even look on the back, tables are huge. <laughs> so, um, but really the anything in red is what's statistically significant. Um, like for example, we have percent organic matter. There was a statistical difference at strike farms between 2018 and 2017, but really it, that might not be biologically significant because that's just such a small difference between the years. It's not really anything that should impact the soil a whole lot or the plant growth. Um, and so the really varying results, and a lot of that could just be due to the fact that we were sampling after our farmers had gone in and tilled every year, and that can just basically reset the soil. So we don't have a whole lot of differences there. Most of that difference comes between years. Um, that's the same thing for bulk density. So if you look on the front, I've got just like a little graph there. Um, and we saw that bulk density decreased uh, at 13 mile and strike farms from 2017, it was higher and it decreased in 2018. And as bulk density is decreasing, that means we have less compaction. Um, and sometimes that can happen just because of tillage. Tillage can break that up and we can have less compact soils. Um, am I forgetting anything? <laughs> so there's, both of these projects have so much information. Mm -hmm. So that's why we thought we have the handout. Hopefully it'll help us give you guys the main the main results we're seeing, but do you want to talk a little bit about the livestock that they're using at um, the Black Cat, the, yeah. the sheep and yep. stuff? Yeah, so um, this project was called Livestock Integrated Systems and Small Scale Vegetable Farming Systems. Um, so really it was geared towards any time, type of livestock. We had plans of grazing geese and chickens and swine and cattle even. Um, but it's just kind of worked out that it was all sheep. So uh, Black Cat has caracal sheep. Um, so they're more of like a coarser fiber, if you've ever seen those before. Um, and then Becky has some sort of long haired sheep. She's got a mixture of different things. Becky has a... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what they look like. I know, I can picture those. <laughs> Dave, can you think of what sheep she I don't know. I can't remember. She's got quite a mixture. She does. Of different things out there. A lot of colored fiber in yeah. her block. But it has been the, the squash grazing. I, I think one of the coolest parts of this project is just seeing what kind of things sheep will eat. And we've done this at Town's Harvest too, putting sheep out on plots, on vegetable plots. Uh, one of the coolest things we saw was having sheep graze corn stalks. And the sheep actually learned to walk up to the corn stalk, put it between their front legs, walk down the stalk and push it over, eat all the leaves, eat the top, and then they'd keep walking and it would just flip back up. <laughs> and so we have, we've grazed cilantro in a cover crop before, and I thought that kind of led me to thinking it'd be a really interesting study because all the sheep smell like cilantro. <laughs> so if you feed sheep, and I know that there has been a couple studies on, uh, feeding sheep and the effect on flavor of the meat. Um, but I think using cilantro or maybe grazed rosemary with sheep. Yeah. <laughs> maybe kind of rosemary flavored lamb. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a, out at uh, 13 mile where we're doing, we're grazing the squash residue. There's a whole bunch of mint out there and they won't touch the mint. So they're just not interested in grazing mint. Um, we've at uh, Strike Farms, and Strike Farms actually just went out of business, and so they're trying to regroup and kind of left a big hole in the Gallatin Valley because a lot of people in the grocery stores were relying on them for produce. But thankfully, it's our last year data collection, so we're still grazing sheep at their place, and they had a cover crop field, but all of the rest of their operations have stopped. They had a kale and arugula field that we put sheep out. So the sheep just loved the kale and it took them a long time to decide to eat the arugula. Um, yeah, it's just too spicy for them. Uh, what else have we grazed? Somebody looked at milk sheep. 
No, so no, that good. would be really interesting too, though. Because we we meal cars. Oh, okay. And, and see well, it, and in Europe they actually will tell you what fields they're grazing on when the cheeses are made. Oh, so wow. you can choose the cheese based on oh, which that one would be you prefer. Really cool. So there's anecdotal evidence. <laughs> well, and they had at the University of Wisconsin they had a big dairy sheep herd that they actually just liquidated about two or three years ago. So they had a whole bunch of East Frisian, a whole dairy program that, that just budget cuts, they had to sell off everything, which is really disappointing. And there are, and I know Dave and I were talking about this, there are a, a couple dairies, uh, sheep dairies in Montana. It'd be cool to collaborate with them and see if we could feed them, I don't know, some kind of spicy herb and see if we could have flavored milk and turn that into cheese or something. That would be really neat. Yeah, because so then definitely we can feed them. Yeah, it definitely it comes, comes through, through the milk. Yeah. yeah, that'd be really interesting. Um, what else? Oh, the buckwheat was kind of a learning curve for us with grazing uh, sheep. When the producers that we're working with, they we told them, you know, do whatever you want. And we'll just come in and, and take our measurements. And they've been really good to work with, though, and have asked, you know, oh, would it be more convenient for us to plant it this time or plant this crop? And we pretty much told them just avoid buckwheat if possible so we don't have to deal with the photosensitive sheep so that was kind of the only thing that we found that is not it's palatable but just causes those side effects that we don't really want to deal with and that was a solid field of buckwheat right solid paddock it wasn't solid it wasn't mm -hmm. solid it was okay. a mixture and they kind of picked out the buckwheat in enough quantity that it did cause them to be photosensitive I do have pictures of sheep just completely neurologic, just drooling and <laughs> stargazing. And I thought oh, I was so—I was a grad student. I was so scared when I called Pat and had to tell him, "I think the sheep are dying. I don't know why." <laughs> it's, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, yeah, Trustum's project is really cool, though. It's—it's it's fun to. It's it's nice to have our research fields here and be able to do things in a research setting, but it, I think it's almost more practical to do things at a certain operation at a farmer's field, and it's more relatable for people to to be able to say. Like I, Perry kind of mentioned this too, we have really high preset here. We have really good soil, so when we're doing all this research here, and people up in the Golden Triangle are like, well. That doesn't really apply yeah. to us just because of the amount of preset you get. We're almost irrigated compared to them. So it's nice to be able to travel to Colorado and different places in the valley and, and do some data collection. Do you find most people are open to it and excited about it? That yeah. they want to collaborate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're all really great to work with. And usually they'll come out and talk to me when I'm out in the field. and. Um, they're just quite friendly and they want to know like when you get results please email us and they're usually just very interested in what's going on with their soil and they're, they're really nice to work with and um, like black cat I know I think they've been grazing crops even you know before the study so they just wanted to say if you have information that can show what we're doing is good and they're just excited to see what we come up with out of this whole project so yeah yeah, and even like, um, not even just the farmers we collaborate with, even just people around the community are pretty interested. I've been out at strike farms and people will come by and ask them, well, what are you doing? Do you, can we, uh, you know, use your sheep out on our fields? And I mean, it's, there's a lot of interest in it, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. And a lot, and a lot of this can be, I mean, cattle can be used in place mm -hmm. of sheep too. It's just happened that, um, sheep are pretty easy for us to move around and, you know, if you get a sheep that escapes, you can literally go pick it up and put it back <laughs> where it to where it should be. I think sheep have been really convenient, and like we were talking about, especially around Bozeman, where everyone buys these little ranchettes, and they all want everyone wants their little piece of land, but no one has livestock. No one wants. They obviously don't have the equipment to hang it. Um, when I had my own flock of sheep, I just put up an ad on Craigslist one year looking for summer pasture I had 30 sheep and I said you know I'm willing to split them up too if you have a small area I have electric fence if you have a small area that you need graze that you don't want to mow I'll just bring my sheep and I was just inundated with responses I had so many people that wanted me to bring my sheep to their place and I had free summer grazing other than the labor uh, free summer grazing the entire season